Hey, what's going on, everybody? Nick Zappanero here once again from the Divi Crypto Podcast. We have another incredibly special episode today as we have one of the first, potentially the first Divi Project advisor, Mr. Tim Sanders, former CSO of Yahoo and writer of multiple books, and maybe most notably Love is a Killer App, one of my favorite books. I recommend it to quite a few people. On a, on a regular basis. How are you doing today? Doing good, Nick. Nice to see you, man. Good. Good to see you as well. Um, you know, we're out here, obviously, at World CryptoCon at the beautiful Cosmopolitan Hotel, and we have the opportunity to talk, and anytime we get to do that, I, I'm always honored. So thank you for coming on. Um, you yeah, know, I, I'm absolutely stone cold sober, sober for this out of respect for you, so this is great. <laughs> I plan to be lucid, perfect, helpful. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So before we get into, you know, talking about crypto and things like that, you know, let's get a little bit of background on how you got into the startup space. I know you have had, how many successful exits have you, have you seen over the years? 11, not counting um, Broadcast.com, which was Mark Cuban's startup back in the late 90s. So that's huge. So that's I was just an employee there. I wasn't an advisor or a board member there. So. But it was still probably a, a massive platform to... to jumpstart part of your career at least. It was, right? it was the, the liftoff platform for me working for Mark. I got to say that. I can imagine. I mean, how, how was working with him? Did you ever work direct? Oh face yeah, face? sure. I, you know, Mark was the kind of guy that, and I was in the sales team, he was the kind of guy that would walk up to you every day and if you weren't on the phone pitching, he'd say, who's writing you a check? <laughs> because he believed, and this is a real good takeaway, Without customers, there is no business. That's very true. I mean, there's actually footage of him um, back in 1996 presenting at some little thing um, with his, his, his funky you know, mullet haircut back then. And that's what he'd say. He could say, you have an idea, that doesn't mean you have a business. You've raised money, that doesn't mean you have a business. Um, you've got talent, that doesn't mean you have a business. You've got patents, that doesn't. He says, you don't have a business until you have customers that are willing to pay you and you know you can satisfy them over and over again. Drilled that into me and every startup that I joined after that as a board advisor, and I joined 13, so two times we didn't exit. Okay. Um, they always showed me a path to having customers. I did join some pre-customers, but most of the time I joined them when they could demonstrate that they could keep existing customers happy, and that became our path to the exit. That's fantastic. And I, f I feel like, you know, sometimes the failures are great learning lessons. Did you learn anything significant from those two exits that didn't pan out? Well, yeah. Um, I learned a couple of things, right? <laughs> um, here's the thing I learned. The magic number when it comes to founders is two and no more than two. You can do it with one if you've got a real megalomaniac genius that doesn't play well with others like <laughs> Elon Musk or something like that. Um, but generally speaking, the, the, the perfect formula is the Jerry David Yahoo, the Larry Serge, you know, um, Google. Google. Um, the two Steves at Apple. I mean, over and over again, if you find two and they kind of complete each other, one's usually highly analytic and got an engineering push. Mm -hmm. uh, the other's a little more conceptual and has kind of a marketing vibe. That's a really good founding team. I think in crypto, they both need to know how to code. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know how to code, you don't know how to manage people that code, whether yeah. they're your FTEs or somebody that you're trusting with an outsourcing project. So that's the first thing I've learned. I'm never going to join a startup again uh, where there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight Justice League number of founders, <laughs> especially when the idea of who is a founder is based on who was at some meeting or who was willing to work early. Sure. Right? A founder is a person who has a critical seed in the idea. If they hadn't have come around, the idea would never have been completed. And all those pairs I told you, each one of them had a symbiotic relationship. If you had just Jerry Yang, you wouldn't have had Yahoo. If you had just Larry Page, all you'd have had is a search engine algorithm called PageRank. And the story goes on and on. So that's the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned when I looked at this is that you have to believe you're always behind schedule in fundraising. If you ever get comfortable that you have enough time to raise money to continue to make payroll, you will run out of time. So one of our two exits, and two of the exits where I wish we'd have got more money, were simple runway issues. Hmm. They got behind, 
They got some emergency cash when there was no time on the clock. Fortunately, in two of the situations, we were able to find a white knight. But basically, in those situations, nobody really got healthy on the deal. Yeah. Maybe some original investors might have got a double ratchet, but that was it. And one of them, we just had to close it down. And it's always because the founder, the CEO, they, they have too much confidence about fundraising because they've got leads. People say, I'm going to invest in you. Listen, it's not a lead until there's a term sheet. That's correct. If they don't sign something, it's not a lead. It's a tire kicker. <laughs> and so you need to always think of yourself as behind schedule. And so that's my new test question when I join startups. So I always ask the CEO, it's a trick question, are you ahead of schedule or behind schedule? If they say we're behind schedule, I give them a second meeting. Nice. That's good advice. But you obviously have had more successes than... We won't call them failures, we'll call them learning lessons. I had my own startup that uh, called NetMinds, um, created a, pub, a, a publishing marketplace, if you will. Okay. Um, and um, we ended up um, you know, selling for parts and capitulating and just giving you know, the original guys money back. So I've also had my own failure. And by the way, uh, it came down to team chemistry. So, so in this situation, we had four co-founders. See, that was the problem. We had two too many, but we weren't, we weren't able to see the warning signs early enough on team chemistry. And to quote Gary Vaynerchuk, self-awareness is pretty damn important. Yeah. That's not to quote Gary Vaynerchuk. That's like to quote very Gary Vaynerchuk as edited by Joel Osteen. But still, <laughs> Chemistry is really important and, and self-awareness is really important. So when there's a founder that's not self-aware and they're causing problems with the chemistry, you're going to have problems overall. Definitely. The potential investors see it. It affects your ability to keep cadence going on your engineering builds and it keeps you very slow when it comes to marketing uh, programs that move the needle. So as you've you know taken all of these projects on and had all of these successful exits, you've probably learned to become a pretty pretty good investor, right? I'm trying, it's important. Yeah, and obviously, and I don't I don't mean to aid you here, but you're getting closer to retirement. Obviously, you're thinking a little bit more about what you're going to do post retirement, making investments prior to yeah. that is probably part of that, right? It's an ongoing discussion. So, the disclosure here is um, I'm 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 this many. Okay. <laughs> Um, which means that in less than 10 years, I am going to retire, hopefully. I, I don't sure. want to work till I'm 70. And uh, for those of you that say, really, he's 57? As Kathy Griffin likes to say, I used to live in L.A. and I had a good dentist. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I do think a lot about retirement because if you don't think about retirement, you have to continue to think about working, mm. right? If I don't think about retirement, then I'm going to be driving an Uber when I'm 75. Right. And I see it. I get picked up by those guys oh, all, yeah. the time. all the time. But the, the secret to, to investment, at least as far as I'm concerned, is you have to understand your risk tolerance, okay. right? So, so as a general rule, I take my biggest risks with my time and the least amount of risks with my cash. I'm sorry to say cash, I know that's fiat. But um, I, take, I take more time investments than I take money investments. And it's sort of like living here in Las Vegas. People ask me all the time, uh, what's the secret to gambling in Las Vegas? And I tell people, I say, there's a surefire way for you to double your money every time you come to Vegas. You wanna know the secret? I do. Take that $100 bill, and fold it in half, <laughs> put it back in your damn pocket. <laughs> I, I, the, 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 the pain of losing exceeds the joy of winning for me when it comes to gambling, which means, and I ask people this all the time, if that's how you feel about gambling, then you have a low risk tolerance when it comes to your money that you've earned the hard way. So as a result, I try to look for things uh, that uh, have, a, have a limited downside. So the way I think about it is that if I have 12 areas I invest, there's about three things I want to go big on, and they're pretty low risk. Okay. And they're not really going to gain me much more than 4% a year, to be honest with you. Anybody that talks about 6% a year must have given money to Madoff, okay? <laughs> it's really more like four, sure thing. right? Because um, you have to look at like the bellwethers, like CD's not even a point. So trust me, four is pretty good year in and year out over the course of time. So three I'm going to go big on, and they're going to earn 4% back. And then the other nine are going to have a variety of upsides, anywhere from 6% to 30%. And I'm willing to lose on a few of those, but I don't go that deep on those. As a matter of fact, I go in kind of small, and then I go bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, like, for example, um, I've got a guy who gave me a great opportunity that I've researched a lot. I feel pretty good about uh, in the area of gold. And um, it's a place that I can diversify um, because I don't want to just be stocks and cash, right. like stocks and bonds and cash, which we can talk about for a minute. But I like, I like a commodity like gold, especially if I invest directly in gold bullion or gold mines. And the reason why is the same reason I like to have a crypto position too. Um, 
There's no reason that you can believe that the United States is immune from the same monkey business that we've seen in Greece or that we've seen in Venezuela. Now you can blame those on being a, Venezuela is a technically a third world country with the crazy guy. Greece has a legacy of non-work uh, culture that led to their situation. Look, they were manipulated by humans. Um, humans aren't that good at manipulating, but artificial intelligence is wonderful at manipulating. So first world countries like the US, like France, like England, like Russia, at some point in the future are going to have either the banking system, the capital reserve system, or even the entire political system manipulated to the point that your cash and your stock will be worth zero. Right. And you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do then. So that's why I like the idea of having a diversified position where I say over here, I've got some commodities like gold, which are going to have value absent a, a real financial system. And over here, I'm going to have a position in crypto, uh, which is going to give me a great hedge, uh, especially given the fact that there are ATMs and it would be an emergency way uh, for me to live. So that's how I talk to the average person about crypto as an important sliver, slice or chunk those are the three versions, depending on your love of crypto, that you need to have in your position. If your entire retirement position is based on USD somehow, right. whether it's a stock, a bond, 401k, or cash on hand, or a house, which is still back to USD. If your entire position is based on that, um, then you're not being realistic about the advances in technology, the advances of market manipulation, and just the general business cycle. I think that becomes more and more relevant as you be, as you get closer to retirement age too, because a lot of people do have you know that four hundred one k set up, but you need if if it crashes again, it takes you know five to ten years for it to even recover back to the right. original point. Right. But you might not have ten years; you might be retiring in, right. in five. Yeah. So you know, I would definitely agree, and I think it's really smart that you're diversifying into all these things. I tell you one more thing, just a little thing. Sure. Uh, for people in my age range, say 45 to, to 65, all four of you that are listening or watching this, um, your kids aren't going to take you in like the aging boomers' kids did or like the greatest generation's kids did. It's just a different world. The millennials and the Zs are not developing a good cash savings position. So they're just a little bit better than check to check and their credit's not that good. Mm -hmm. They don't have the excess cash to take in their aging parents whose retirement has been blown. Like we saw in the savings crash in the 1990s as we saw like in the 2001 crash. Um, you don't have a backstop is my point. So you'd better be super serious about your retirement and to your point, you better know there's gonna be these dips where 30% goes away suddenly with a recession and you've gotta have a backup plan. Right. Now, obviously, you mentioned crypto as part of your investment profile. Are you just looking at top 10 coins? Do you just put everything into Bitcoin? How do you d diversify as far as crypto goes? You know, I, I, I've, I've put all my money in Doge because I love the kitty. The <laughs> it's kitty, pretty stable, actually. It's sort of like, it's sort of like where I, not, by the way, I'm just kidding. I haven't put, put a, city, a cent into that. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, Bitcoin is, is, is got, you know, value. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's to me a stable coin. I'm not a tether guy. Sure. I mean, you got to trade a lot to be a tether person or you're, you're, you're moving something somewhere. I don't like to try to figure out, you know, um, transaction rates and manipulate that. But, you know, Bitcoin's a good one. And then I like to look, um, I like to look on the second page or the third page of coin market cap for opportunities because, I mean, the whole point of crypto is to get a position uh, that has multiple upsides, not just 4%. Right. Right. And see, that's the issue. With Bitcoin, if you're just a hodler like me, um, you're not buying and selling it. So you're not buying it at seven thousand and reselling it at nine thousand. I'm not. I'm not that kind of person. So when you kind of think about Bitcoin and you look out into the future and you don't talk to Tim Draper, um, it is not much more than the four to six percent that you're getting with all your other investments. So while Bitcoin is somewhat stable, if you will, it's not going to double, triple, quadruple, etc. Um, but things you find on the second and the third page on Coin Market Cap will. And that's why I'm so excited to see Divi consistently on the second page of Coin Market Cap somewhere in that you know 170 to 200 range because that's where a lot of value is. The other thing I think about is that I learned from Mark that when you think about a stock, you want to look for dividends. Dividends are important, especially if you're going to own a lot of a stock, because the dividend gives you back something for holding it sure. over the course of time. That's why I'm super excited about masternodes. That's why I'm you know, very um, appreciative of uh, companies like Dash, 
uh, you know, that kind of set the set the way to help people understand yeah. uh, that you can create a, a, a master node that actually earns. But but I got to tell you, the Divi master node solution um, is not only easy and elegant, um, it dependably creates value, and it looks to me like dividends that you would get from a stock, except they're delivered daily and not annually. Yeah, yeah, I think that you know having a source of active income like that is it keeps you from having to do lift you know until you're 70 and things like that um so that's that's remarkable that you're you're able to find these types of investments even on i think a lot of people are so stuck in like the top 50 or even the top 10 Mm -hmm. coins and not thinking about the fact that those coins are already quadruple the price that they started at they're already at market caps that are astronomical in comparison to the value they bring There are other opportunities out there. Yeah, there's a lot of shit coins. Yeah. But there are some diamonds in the rough, like the diamond Divi yep. master. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, you know, I, I look at coins that um, pose utility value, right? They mm-hmm. can actually have users. Like I'll, we've talked to people here at this conference that use Divi to get things done. Right. Right? I mean, one of our investors used Divi to build his house. Right. He'd show contractors the, the, the master node opportunity. They accepted it over fiat. He's actually using Divi. And it's not just because of the master node. It's a combination of the simplicity of transferring and using the Divi yep. so that that user easily downloaded the wallet. It had a graphic interface that gave them comfort. It was an easy send and receive. There were zero transaction fees. You know, it was the, the simplicity combined with the master node was really the key yeah. uh, to Divi having a perceived utility. When I look at other altcoins, that's my asset test. Not so much the master node, but I want to know, um, would someone who's hodling some of it actually be able to use it with the person they've just met? That's a really good sign that utility is built inside that coin. Agreed. Yeah, we, I actually just uh, heard from a community member who uh, helps us beta test some of our you know, forthcoming software, and he said... Um, he's working with an event company running sound for a, an upcoming mu- music festival in his town. Um, and he convinced the showrunner to pay him fully in Divi. Mm-hmm. Um, we're paying our a couple of our employees 100% in Divi. I think three of them are, are full Divi employees yeah. at this point. That's a good sign. It's not just a good sign of what people believe in, but it's also a good sign that they know how to set up a master node. It's simple enough to do. They have the simplicity in the wallet. Uh, to not have that that oh shit moment every time they try to check their balance like you have with other coins. Yeah. Right. So I think I think that's really important. The other thing I look for is I look for um, a coin whose team has been on the other side of hell and back. Sure. Because there's not a coin moving forward that's not going to have that valley of despair where they can't execute on time. They're about to run out of cash. Mm-hmm. They have a revolt inside of their community or Telegram. They all have them, right? I just want the ones who've been through it and survived because they're going to be more mature. They've learned some lessons from it. What I don't want is one that's really early stage, yeah. that's raised a lot of money on a really important concept, but they've yet to actually release builds and fail. I yeah. worry about this. Yeah, definitely. And I think especially after 2017, 2018, and there's still new coins coming. Do you think that do you think that we should slow down the the new coin generation and and just focus on the projects that exist and and see if they can deliver? Do you think that's holding back the altcoin market to some degree? Well, I think I think that for me it's a little bit of a different thing. So what I saw with altcoins starting about a year and a half ago was a lot of them kind of tried to follow Gary Garlinghouse's Ripple thing where we're going to take something in the real world that's inefficient, like cross-border payments, yeah. and we're going to use blockchain to make them more efficient, and then we're going to tokenize it. What I worry about is, and then we're going to tokenize it. <laughs> in other words, it's not an organic crypto play. So what I'm seeing with a lot of altcoins now is they're just blockchain plays that instead of following the traditional capitalization route of raising money and, and distributing shares and taking fiat in exchange for their services, they've tokenized it. That's... Um, that's not intrinsic to the actual business itself like with Divi. Right. It's like a layer on top. We're, we're tokenizing it because we can, but not because we should. Those companies should be blockchain plays. Sure. They should be real world companies that leverage blockchain technology and require companies to write them checks. And let me tell you why. Ripple should be a cautionary tale. People are like, are you kidding? Ripple's a top five coin that's moving sideways. Yeah. From now into the foreseeable future. I mean, how long have they been where they've been at? 26 cents. I remember when they were 72 cents, right? right? And they were supposed to take off and go to the moon. I remember when there were rumblings out there that they were making maybe 50, 100 million dollars being paid by big banks, by JP Morgan to provide technology. 
Let me tell you how big companies think about little companies they do business with in the short term. They're just buying time. They're developing it on their own. I always love to tell the story of Kiznos. Um, have you ever had Kiznos? No. Like Kiznos, like toasted sandwiches from several years oh, ago? Oh, Quiznos. Quiznos. Did I pronounce it wrong? <laughs> oh, I never heard it. Quiznos. Quiznos. You I'm know calling what? it Kiznos also, from now on, though. I also called the, the artist from Empire um, Jesse Smollett, so I don't, <laughs> I don't get it right myself. Um, so, um, Quiznos? Quiznos. No, it's Kiznos now. Okay, no, Quiznos. That's way fancy. Have you had it's it? like Target. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, entrepreneur is a fancy French word for salesperson, so there you go. Um, you've had it, right? I have, yeah. Delicious, right? So the, the, the cautionary tale about Quiznos is that they had a market lead around toasted sandwiches. They had take the sub, it took the subcategory, which was largely um, a non-toasted category. It was soft bread category, okay? Right. And they brought in the concept of toasted, and it was really different, it really stood out. See, people were like, really? They were the only, yes, that if you read the research on them, and you look at their run-up in the market, it was because they had an exclusive product offering that people liked, and they were growing really fast. And then Subway had a meeting, and they added toasters. <laughs> And that oh, was like the Jesus. end of it. That was the end of it. I mean, it was just like, you know, Motorola uh, back, I think it was like during the 1930s and 40s. And, you know, when Motorola first started, um, after they failed making batteries, their big product was called a battery eliminator. That's mm. so what the battery eliminator did is it was an adapter from a battery-driven home device like a battery-driven Victrola. And it went on that battery-driven Victrola and plugged in where the battery did and plugged into the new AC outlets that were going into all the homes. Mm -hmm. And the battery eliminator was a robust business until you know RCA started to add an AC cord to their TVs and radios and then the battery eliminator business was gone and Motorola had to reinvent themselves. I say all of this because these companies that are using blockchain to solve a problem in the real world and then just tokenizing it, we're making it easier for you to send MP3s to each other. We're making it easier for you to trade health insurance benefits with each other. Mm -hmm. These are all blockchain plays. Sure. And blockchain's gonna be bigger than crypto. We all know this. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is the new internet, to quote Silicon Valley, right? It's a new way of thinking about creating trust and eliminating the, the, va the, you know, the, the things that happen when you have a, a ledger like we've traditionally had. But it doesn't mean that every altcoin should be crypto. And so that's another thing I look really hard at. I look really hard at that, the intrinsic nature of a crypto to a coin. Yeah, it really comes down to creating, I've, I've been saying, benefit-driven pathways to adoption and stop this focus on feature-driven paths to adoption. Because I think so many coins and, and blockchain companies are so focused on making that one feature, the toasting of the subs, for example, so awesome that they forget that no one actually cares yeah. because anybody can toast a sub. It's not, yeah, it's just not a defensible position. Exactly. There's no barrier to entry. You know, we said Silicon Valley, but I laughed because I was like binging on it. I was taking a trip to South Africa for a gig and I was like binging on Silicon Valley. And I remember when they did a coin, right? Mm -hmm. If you remember, they did a coin because they gave away some, um, some computer power credits to their VC and then she promptly resold them for fiat, mm -hmm. right? And they said, wow, what if we tokenized our, uh, you know, the credits, c c the credits uh, for our computing power and they failed. Because what they really should have done is thought about it. What it really was was cloud computing and sold it for cash like Amazon Web Services or anybody else with a brain on their head. That's what I mean when I see the false tokenization of coins, right. and that's why they fail. Don't introduce more friction for no reason. Oh, I love that, right? Because when you look at success, success is demand divided by friction. Mm -hmm. That's it. When oh, you look yeah. at Amazon success, demand divided by friction. That's why brick and mortar had a problem. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you can get something delivered in some cases that day. And you can return it easily. Yeah, sometimes, for, most of the time for free. For free, right? <laughs> so there's just no friction in the sale, whereas, you know, you buy something, you gotta drive to the store, you gotta go back to the store, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, just think of that formula, demand divided by friction, and understand it is significantly easier to increase demand than to reduce friction, especially when it's structural friction based on how you built your business. Couldn't agree more. Well, Tim, do you have anything you wanna leave our listeners and viewers with before we sign off for the day? Yeah, you know, I think that it's been a, a very tough last few years with a little glimmer of hope a few months ago where we saw things go up. 
Um, but if crypto was going to be put back in the bottle, it would have been put back in the bottle by 2015. So this is going to be around for quite a long time. And as this unstable world produces more threats against banking systems and fiat currency, um, crypto will only get stronger. I'm not hinging my belief in the long-term success of crypto on something like Facebook's Libra. I'm hinging it more on my lack of trust in the banking system and fiat to be independent of artificial intelligence, to be independent of political manipulation. So stay long. Whatever coin you decide to invest in, whatever crypto you decide to believe in, don't leave the space. Leave bad coins. Love it. Well, that is going to conclude our amazing interview of Mr. Tim Sanders, I really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. And for all of your advice over the past two years, it really can't be appreciated enough. It's definitely gotten us through some really difficult times. So Excellent, buddy. Excellent. Thank Good you, to man. see you, man. Always a pleasure. All right, man. See you next time.